Real questions, real answers for real life. Come on in and pull up a chair. It's time to discuss the issues of the day here at 1850 Main Street. We've got Rob, Allen, and Dave at the table today asking the question, why would an authoritarian government want to shut down the local pub? Dave, one of the things Rob and I were talking about before we were recording today was was that we 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 want to, we're imagining a segment of 1850 where we grab a book off the bookshelf of the American Mission Center each week. You know, and, and nice. what if we have guests come in here and they they get to peruse the bookshelf and grab a book that sparks their interest off the shelf? Better be uh, in English if you want me around. It, <laughs> yeah, well, Dr. Allen can grab the French ones off yeah, the shelf. Right. Um, Jeff's got the Greek and Hebrew. We're okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm doing, I'm doing I'll English today. I'll take the pictures. I get the pictures. <laughs> Rob's got the comic books. We'll do. <laughs> me too. Me too. Um, but I, I grabbed the book off the shelf because uh, people need to know we're recording from a studio. Yes, but we're also, we're living in a library here. There's shelves all over the place. And uh, one of the things, one of our missions here is to restore the reading of books. And so I grabbed one of my favorite C.S. Lewis books, That Hideous Strength, off the shelf. Now, for those who, who may not be familiar, That Hideous Strength is uh, part of his sci-fi space trilogy. Part three of the trilogy. Yep. Uh, part, yes, part three of the, of the trilogy. And this is, this is sort of his um, dystopian fantasy genre. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I might add, mm-hmm. it was required reading at the American Policy. What was that? Four or five years ago that was required yeah. reading once again for everyone. Yeah. We do have a longer form discussion yeah. on this book um, on the public square. That's right. We, we have did a, longer... a full public square broadcast on yes. this book. Yeah, that's worth <laughs> yeah. that. That's at thepublicsquare.com. That's definitely worth going into. Yeah, it, that's that's one of my favorite programs that we've done. Everybody read the book or listened to it. I actually, I admit, I did audio book on it. So uh, full confession. But. Uh, but one of the wow, wow. how's he dropping that one? Think of you now, wow! <laughs> how is he dropping goodness. that one three minutes into the show? <laughs> wow! Uh, yeah, hope, but, you're, hope uh, your mom's not listening. Yeah. But I've got, I do have a paper copyright right here. You can, <laughs> okay, you can hear. Right, let's see, yeah, hear the pages. Hey, open that up and and um, the first page, uh, the title page. Mm-hmm. There's kind of a subtitle on that hideous strength, right? <laughs> yes, it's called a modern fairy tale for grownups. That is that the subtitle you're thinking of? Yeah, a modern fairy tale for grownups. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, that's a good description of it. Uh, well, it, anyway, one of the one of the reasons I the reason I grabbed this is there was a passage that jumped out to me when I first listened to it, and it kind of it kind of speaks to what we're trying to accomplish on 1850. And so it's a bit of an extended quote, but I'd like to to read it to you guys and then and then get your thoughts on it. So the main character Mark is kind of being taken in by the nice, N-I-C-E, kind of this dystopian, technocratic, elitist government uh, technocracy. And so he's kind of- Can I add that Mark is a journalist, he's in media, and he's been recruited to become the nice storyteller, the N-I-C-E, to tell nice stories about the nice. Okay. The Uh, nice, the bad guys. So he's having, he's kind of, he's- He's being wooed by this organization, so he's going around with this guy Cosser. They're 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 kind of looking at the town that they're in. So I, all right, I'll read it now. It says and he Mark could not help rather liking this village that they're walking around in. When at one o'clock he persuaded Cosser to turn into the Two Bells, which is a it's a local pub, um, and he even said so. They had both bought sandwiches, brought sandwiches with them, but Mark felt that he would like a pint of beer. In the two bells, it was very warm and dark, for the window was small. Two laborers, no doubt recalcitrant and backwards, were sitting with earthenware mugs at their elbows, munching very thick sandwiches, and a third was standing up at the counter conducting a conversation with the landlord. No beer for me, thanks, said Cosser, and we don't want to muck around here too long. Um, What were you saying? Mark says, I was saying that on a fine morning, there was something rather attractive about a place like this, in spite of all its obvious absurdities. Coster says, yes, it is a fine morning. Makes a real difference to one's health. A bit of sunlight. Mark says, oh, no, I was thinking of this place. You mean this? Said Coster, glancing around the room. I should have thought it was just the sort of thing we wanted to get rid of. No sunlight, no ventilation. Haven't much use for alcohol myself. Read the Miller Report. 
But if people have got to have their stimulants, I'd like to see them administered in a more hygienic way. Mark says, I don't know that the stimulant is quite the whole point, said Mark, looking at his beer. The whole scene was reminding him of drinks and long talks long ago of laughter and arguments in undergraduate days. Somehow one had made friends more easily then. He wondered what had become of all that set. I don't know, I'm sure, said Cosser in answer to his last remark. Nutrition isn't my subject. You'd want to ask Stock about that. What I'm really thinking about, said Mark, is not this pub, but the whole village. Of course, you're quite right. This sort of thing has to go, but it has its pleasant side. We'll have to be careful that whatever we're building up in its place will really be able to beat it on all levels, not merely in efficiency. So here you have these two guys plotting and planning to decimate the local pub, and they're not quite sure what they want to build in its place, but I'm sure it'll be better. Let's make sure it'll be better. It'll be more efficient, yeah. It'll certainly be more efficient and healthy and good for you. I have all kinds of COVID bells and whistles popping off in my head right now. Uh, (laughs) And if you know anything about the Inklings and C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and um, Owen Barfield and all all that whole set, you know that the the pub, the central place of meeting and, and talking through what they were working on was very, very important to C.S. Lewis and his friends. So he would have seen this type of thing as one of the heights of, of evil, that someone would come in and destroy the local pub. He could, it's almost as if there couldn't be anything less human or humane than doing that for him. Yeah, it just reminds me of so many times we think, especially when we look today at government, they're smarter than the rest of us. Yes, they know what's good for you. Mm -hmm. So just trust them. And if you don't believe they're smarter than the rest of us, just ask them. They'll tell you they're smarter than the rest of us. And you see by the decisions they make each and every day. um, Well, and this is what, this is a picture of what happened during COVID. What got closed down? The the local mom and pop shops. You could buy stuff on Amazon. You could go to the big box stores, but, but you, but you couldn't have a family owned corner business open. Because that was certainly going to be bad for people. The corner fruit stand was a bad place, but you wouldn't get COVID if you went to the large box grocery store to get fruit. Yeah, if you went to Target, you were fine. But but you couldn't go to your pub down the street and talk to an an, uh, actual human being face to face. I I can only imagine what Lewis would have thought had he been around during, during that time. Thanks for stopping by at 1850 Main Street. We're glad you're here. Do you want to learn more about what is really going on behind the scenes in public policy? Tune in to The Public Square on over 200 radio stations coast to coast. Or download the free Public Square mobile app from your app store. Just look for the lamppost. Find out what America is really talking about at thepublicsquare.com. Well, Lewis and Tolkien both fought in World War I. Lewis carried shrapnel in his body his whole life from being wounded in World War I. Mm-hmm. Um, and you all know this story. I know that, that Lewis uh, went to the war as an atheist. He came home from the war as an even more bitter atheist. And the C.S. Lewis that you're reading uh, from right now, and that hideous strength, which I think was published in 1946, is not the same person that we experience in 1918, 1919, 1920. Something happened to him. Um, We did another really interesting program on the public square, Christmas in America, 1951, where we told that story. Uh, And one of my favorite presentations I think we've ever done in any form of long form radio entertainment variety. What a fascinating, fascinating discussion. So warmly embraced by people. Uh, and beautiful music and all of those p- pieces and parts. But the destruction of the local pub, I think about the Sons of Liberty meeting in New England, across New England, and Sam Adams and the Committee of Co- Committees of Correspondence. How many conversations happened in local taverns and restaurants during the colonial era where people were able to get together in a public place so it looked completely innocent and speak in code to one another for the sake of being able to communicate uh, for the cause of liberty and, and freedom. Um, so, yeah, the thing about Lewis 
and that hideous strength that is really significant. It is one of few of the dystopian type pieces that depicts the collapse of what happens. It doesn't start dystopian. It starts with a group of cultural elites in the administrative state taking over the United Kingdom and doing it primarily through the academic circles and through healthcare. Now, ironically, the craziness of this is that the national health care system of England would come to be known by the acronym yeah. NICE, as if they never read what Lewis wrote in 1946. That was the depth of the total technocracy and the corruption. Or they taking, read it and took the exact opposite message. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, wait, yeah. who's the good guys in this? I can't yeah. remember. We can do it better than Lewis. Watch yeah, this. Yeah. Right. So, so th- this it's is too and now, obvious and, to be obvious. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the, yeah, the, so, and, and the, the idea is that of a technocracy. And that's where Lewis and his colleagues came out with terms that hadn't been used before, uh, where technology became and science, science basically became the ruling moral authority of all. It was the ultimate authority was science and it was adjudicated through the high priest of the technical skills and the scientific skills. Therefore, you had a technocracy that basically was taking over everything. And on the way to a dystopian collapse of all freedom, the technocracy fell. Now, okay, spoiler alert, there is a happy ending to the book, but you've got to read a long time to get there. And it's an exhilarating reality when you do get there. Uh, in that hideous strength. But now I think you bring forth a very important point, and that's that to get there, to get where the science-only crowd wants us, you, you, you stumble across a principle that we've talked about together as friends for years, and that's that history proves when you lose God, you lose man. And you cannot, there's no reason to have a pub or a beautiful community with a town square or a public square. There's no reason to have a wonderful ice cream shop on a sunny day on that beautiful in that beautiful town or a playground with swing sets and, and children playing because it, it's all unnecessary. When you lose God, human beings become objects, not art. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and this is where the the technological flat earth people will always take us. And their method is always going to be the administrative state. Now, some parts of the administrative state are going to be brutal and forceful, but like like private security, armed police, the Gestapo, those sorts of things. That that's very obvious. But there are going to be other pieces that are much more subtle, like perhaps your local library system that adopts an agenda with the purpose of dehumanizing children, making them their believe that they're less than fully human or less than extraordinary gifts and creations of God. You can go, you could be your local school. It could be your local school board. Who knows? It, it could be the sanitation department. I mean, you want to, you want to talk about scratching some COVID scars? Well, How about yes. when we discovered <laughs> that there were governors spending millions of dollars to investigate excrement in wastewaters to be able to track COVID underground to neighborhoods so you couldn't escape their detection. I mean, you play that one out and we did, we play, I mean, we played this out in the public policy arena. We played out the war games on that. Like, what would that look like? You begin to create some of the most zany, insane stuff when the administrative state loses touch with the reality of what it means to be human and what a gift it is to be human. And civil government doesn't exist as the slave master over people, right? That isn't the intent of the government, but they take it to that extreme at times. If we let them. If we let them. Yeah. If we abdicate our responsibility. So a lot of what we're doing here in 1850 is trying to figure out how we do the pushback because it's pretty clear that there is, (laughs) it's so evidently clear that it's almost to the point where you can understand when someone says, well, it's too late. Now, I don't know that it's ever too late. I know in Lewis's perspective, in that hideous strength, it looked way past too late. But the reality was that justice did prevail. I have to tell you that, that when you take a look at the administra- administrative state in the United States of America, at, at what level, the federal bureaucracy, I, I mean, it, it, it's to the place now where in plain sight, federal agencies are lining up their employees, giving them time off, not just to go vote, 
but explaining to them the importance of them using their role as federal agents to get people registered to vote. M might I remind us that these are people that are being funded by our tax dollars? So, I mean, this is, this is, we're to the place where it, it, some people could say it's, it's probably too late. I don't think it's ever too late. I mean, do you guys, do you think it's too late? No, 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 no. And even if it was, you wouldn't necessarily know. Like you, you can't, it's hard, you can't see the future. So you just have to do your job in the meantime. So are you really worried? Are you really worried at the end, Alan, we're going to lose this pub? I mean, you know, this whole 1850 thing's going to disappear because not only can you not have a pub, you can't have a conversation that sounds like one. No, I don't think I don't think we're going to lose it. I I think I think you only truly lose it if you give up. You know, so I think you get knocked down, but you got to keep going. I think I mentioned this on on the public square broadcast that we that we had about that hideous strength, um, but it bears mentioning here. This is just a fun fact about the book. Everybody knows the book 1984 in George Orwell. That's kind of the go-to dystopian novel for high schools, even, even college students to read. What people don't know is that George Orwell uh, read that hideous strength and wrote a review about it in the Manchester Evening News before he published his famous 1984. Did he like it? Well, he thought there was too much spiritual stuff in it, but he oh, did. A surprise. But, yeah, but yeah. So he liked it. You know what's funny though? I had forgotten it said this until I just looked up. I'm looking at the review right now. People can search online. Just just type in that hideous strength George Orwell review. Just type it and you'll find it somewhere. <laughs> but listen to what you guys are getting kicked out of this. Listen to what George Orwell says. He says, Mr. Lewis probably owes something to Chesterton as a writer. <laughs> I forgot he said that in the review. <laughs> <laughs> and people are wondering why that doubles you up in laughter, given, given the fact that you, well, I don't know, you, you kind of like G.K. Chesterton, don't you? Uh, yeah, I, I do. And um, yes, and we've, we, I've, I've worked on a project that actually goes to, to proving uh, or, Orwell's suspicions. Yes, Lewis does <laughs> owe a thing or two to Chesterton as a writer, and it's not a secret. Uh, he says very clearly that he does. So if you want, if you're curious about that train of logic, I'll take you to the... Uh, phone app, which is because some we have never talked about on 1850. There's a phone app, right, Rob, for the public square? Yep. The, if you go to your app store and look for the public square, look for the lamppost. You'll find the public square. And um, yeah, you, you can find it there. And the resource, I think, that you're referencing of Gilbert, Gilbert and Jack. And Jack. A wonderful book that Alan wrote and the audiobook version of it, because Alan likes audiobooks a lot. And he likes regular books. I do like books audiobooks. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it will tell the story of a research project that you've never heard about before regarding C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton. And even if you barely know who those people are, you will really enjoy uh, Gilbert and Jack because it'll give you some background on this conversation, but also give you some insight into a whole lot more. The conversations are just getting started. To get connected, check out 1850mainstreet.com. We don't data mine anyone or sell your information. Subscribe today so you don't miss a single conversation. We'll see you next time here at 1850 Main Street.